Okay, before we learn about the rest of the world, other than the Islamic world during this uh, Unit 3, the middle period here, 600 to 1450, we want to take and pause a little bit and look at commerce and culture and the impact they have on each other. And what we want to look at are the Silk Roads and the other trade networks throughout Afro-Eurasia, as well as the Americas, which have their own separate trade network. And we need to understand how this is going to impact people, uh, how commerce is going to play a role in people's lives. So we start with the most famous of the roads, of course, the Silk Roads. And you take a look in the top right corner, you see this uh, population in millions. And you notice it starts in 400 BCE and takes us all the way up to what we consider the modern world, 1500. The first thing that's fascinating is look at the difference between the Americas and Afro-Eurasia. And that gives you an idea that most of the world's population, substantially more of the world's population, was in Afro-Eurasia as opposed to the Americas. And that's going to stay the same all the way until modern times. You also notice that we have uh, pretty much continual growth. You have a little downfall here, and of course that's when the Roman Empire falls. Uh, and then you have continual climb all the way up until the mid-14th century, and of course that's the Black Death, which devastates Europe's population. And then we see uh, by the mid-1400s a revival and continued growth after that. So the trade networks in the Eastern Hemisphere, Afro-Eurasia, were much more dense than those in America, and we call that a web of trade because it wasn't really truly interconnected the way we see, uh, for example, in this map here in Afro-Eurasia, where ultimately every part of everything was connected somehow. So we have four different trade networks, the Silk Roads, the Sea Roads, the Sand Roads, and the American webs that we're going to talk about. So take a look at some, some items here. What was traded in the long-distance trade of the pre-modern world? So 2011, you have the average distance that a food item traveled about a 1,000 miles to get to your plate, regardless of the food item. Obviously, some things are going to be shorter than others, but just the idea that, that we get our food from such faraway sources um, shows how important trade is to our lives even today. And, of course, it was paramount to people's lives 1,500 years. 2,000 years ago as well. Um, what we don't have back then is the massive quantities of trade that we have today. So it's the beginning of a globalization, the beginning of a more global world, but still not on the scale of what we have today. And you take a look at some of the examples of items here. You have wine. Okay, Obviously, um, it could only go so far because it would spoil, but also it had to be shipped over water because of its weight. You're not going to put wine on the back of a camel's back. It's not going to make sense. Uh, beer uh, definitely can't be transported long distance. It's going to spoil after a few days. So beer is going to have to be more of a local item. Uh, wheat uh, sometimes is profitable ship, but again, only by sea. Uh, then, of course, if it gets wet, that's a problem. Horses and cattle. Uh, you can imagine that's going to stink. Then you have some more uh, higher-end items, porcelain, spices, and silk. Those things are going to be able to be traveled along the Silk Roads um, because they're high-end items, and they're not going to be traded in such high volume as you would, would some more common items. So looking at the Silk Roads, of course, we, we already know the story behind the name, and it's because the number one uh, commodity export from China was, in fact, silk. And uh, the, the thing about the Silk Roads, or the silk itself, is that Chinese women were actually responsible for just about the entire silk-making uh, process, although uh, Chinese families involved in this business were still living in poverty. Uh, I liken it to Chinese people today who live in poverty, and they go to work for Apple making I, uh, iPhones or whatever. Um, they're making one of the most valued items in the world, yet they uh, live in poverty because they're on the low end of the spectrum as far as uh, the value of their work. But back to silk, uh, the reason China has such a hold on silk is because they have uh, the, the knowledge of what to feed, feed the silk worms that spin the silk, and that's mulberry leaves from mulberry trees. Um, but um, it's going to be something that's important for the entire world. Now, the story as to how Europeans eventually got silk is 
uh, more myth than truth, but the idea is that you had a couple of uh, European monks make their way to China, and they were actually spies trying to find out the secret of silk, and they smuggle away silkworms in their robes and take them back to Europe. More likely, the the, the knowledge and know-how of how to do silk uh, actually just made its way slowly across the silk road until it finally reached Europe eventually. So, the Silk Road, you take a look here, this isn't as detailed as a map as earlier, but it gives you an idea. So you have China connected all the way to Western Europe thanks to this. And you have to remember the role of relay trade. And that's important because, again, somebody's not going to travel, for the most part, the entire length of the Silk Roads. They're going to basically go to the next station, the next city. They're going to trade their stuff, make a profit, return home, and do the same thing over and over again. Um, but uh, you have, uh, you know, the Silk Roads ebb and flow with empires, basically. So the Silk Roads were at their strongest and most prosperous when you had strong empires along the Silk Roads or at the ends of the Silk Roads. So when Rome was at its height, when Han China was at its height, the Silk Roads were also at their height. But also later on we'll see uh, the Mongols uh, helping out. Um, the as a matter of fact, the Silk Roads were probably their most prosperous and safest during the Mongol rule, but that's a story for another day. So what's what's being carried along the Silk Roads? Well, uh, you know, how, how much can anything carry? How much can a camel carry, a donkey, a human? Uh, the common measure for a reasonable load for a man to transport is about 50 pounds. Uh, on a good road, how heavily uh, can a cart be uh, weighed down with a horse pulling it? Well, compared to that man's energy, it'll move at around 500 pounds for uh, wheels on a road. 5,000 pounds if you put them on rails, of course that's later on with railroads, and then you can go up to 50,000 pounds on water. Mostly luxury goods are going to be transported along the silk roads because you don't have the ability to carry too heavy a load. You have to have huge caravans if you're going to carry bulk goods, um, a lot of stuff anyway, and so it's just not profitable to carry this stuff over the Silk Road. So you need this stuff to be luxury goods to, to pull in a higher price when you trade or sell it. And so, you know, as each, each time the stuff is traded, the relay trade is going to hike up the prices. And that's going to be important to the trader that they be able to get a good price for their stuff. Now, the unintended consequence of these Silk Roads, of course, the intended consequence was trade and commerce. The unintended consequence is movement of culture, specifically religion. And we look at Buddhism as our prime example. So Buddhism, of course, originates in India. It becomes popular in India uh, under Ashoka. It almost dies out. But then eventually Buddhism is going to spread. And the form of Buddhism we're talking about now is called Mahayana Buddhism. And uh, it's, it's a different type of Buddhism as Buddha leaves China, he takes on some different forms as far as what it really means to be a Buddhist and practice as a Buddhist. So um, the, the people who were most interested in Buddhism, of course, as we already learned, were the merchants, lower caste merchants, because they weren't valued as much in Hinduism. And so they leave, they become merchants, they travel, and they spread the ideas of Buddhism. Now, of course, it's going to get to China eventually. And, of course, China is locked down with Confucianism, is locked down with uh, Taoism. And so they're not going to be too welcoming to this foreign religion. And, and today, of course, we think of Buddhism as hand-in-hand -hand with China, but back then, not so much. And so only foreign merchants could practice, China, uh, practice Buddhism in China until the 5th century CE. Um, now, just like uh, some of the other religions we looked at, conversion was voluntary. Now, what do I mean by Buddhism changes? Well, for the first time in this version of Buddhism, Buddha is now a deity, not just a man. Um, the change in earning merit, uh, the begging bowl, which used to be something that a, a Buddhist monk would need to survive, was now just symbolic. And you see a, a little more compassion in this version of Buddhism as well. Another unintended consequence, movement of diseases. And, uh, you know, these things are going to, the, the more tr trade there is, the more people are moving around, which means the more potential uh, for disease to spread. And immunity is a big factor here. The lack of it in throughout Eurasia meant uh, 
uh, devastating consequences. Uh, we looked at the reasons Rome and Han uh, empires fell, but one of the reasons was disease, and specifically in those two it was smallpox and measles. Those things would not have been a devastating impact to those two without trade along the Silk Road. Um, on the flip side, it strengthens the appeal of Christianity and Buddhism. Christianity in Europe, because people turn to God uh, in the face of disaster. And the same thing in China. So when all this horrible stuff is going on, people are like, why, God, please help us. And so it strengthens their faith. Um, of course, the Black Death in the 14th century, which is toward the end of our unit here, um, ends up uh, you know, killing about a third of Europe's population, and that was because of the Mongols, that the, the Silk Roads were so uh, widely used at that time that the Mongols ended up spreading uh, the Black Death much more quickly than it would have, and of course that devastated Europe more than any place else, largely because Europe was so densely populated, everybody living in quote, close quarters with, with, it was dirtier in Europe than most places, cities in Europe were dirtier than elsewhere, and so that's one of the reasons Europe gets hurt more than any place else. Um, the other thing about the disease is it brings down Christianity in a way, uh, at least the Eastern Orthodox. It's, it begins to weaken Christianity because uh, in Constantinople, for example, in 534, you have thousands of people dying per day because of plague and disease, and that weakens them when they have to fend off the Muslim invaders later on. Now I want to shift briefly to the sea and sand roads. And, of course, we learned about the Oshie, uh, the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Uh, and, of course, this is the largest sea-based network of communication in the world at this time. And you see how far-reaching it is, all the way from the Middle East to East Africa to India to China to Southeast Asia. And, uh, you know, this had been going since the time of the Greeks. So it wasn't anything new. As a matter of fact, the Indian Ocean trade was probably more consistent throughout history than the Silk Roads because you didn't have to worry about the sea roads being unsafe, unlike the Silk Roads when you didn't have strong empires. So what's going to be tra transported here with more bulk goods, staple goods, textiles, timber, sugar, uh, those type of things because you can transport heavier items. And, of course, we have to understand the role of monsoons in playing a key role there. And the monsoons allowed you to travel with a predictable wind. So you could go to Asia during uh, April to September, and conversely, you would come home from November to February. And it was it was very well timed, and people would know. Um, so this existed all the way back to the Greeks, but it becomes even more dense and more heavily traveled and trade more trade during this uh, uh, Middle Ages period from 650 to 1450. Uh, 600 to 1450, and the, Islam plays a role. As Islam grows during this time period, and remember, merchants are valued in Islam, and, and traders are, are big in Islam, that's going to play a key role in strengthening sea road trade. Uh, in Southeast Asia, it's going to have a huge impact because the people there are going to have this balancing act of, well, do we keep our old cultural ways or do we give in to these ways that are coming to us from India, from China, Indianization as they called it. So Buddhism and Hinduism become adopted there. Um, but the interesting thing here is that Southeast Asia doesn't get taken over. There's no imperial rule coming, whether Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism came there. The religion spread, no conquerors came basically, which was good for these people. Um, so it was similar to the Greeks, you know, where the Greeks spread their culture, but they didn't actually conquer anybody. Uh, the picture to the bottom right, well, the whole picture there is, uh, the, the one on the bottom right is a zoomed out one, is uh, Bora Bador, which is the largest Buddhist monument in the world. So the largest Buddhist monument in the world isn't in India, it's home, isn't in China, the country where most Buddhists live, it's in Southeast Asia. Then we switch over to East Africa, and we remember the Swahili people living there, small farming and fishing communities, uh, and the importance of Islam there once it spreads there. That's going to help commercially, so that's going to link them up to the Indian Ocean trade network. They spoke Bantu, uh, but it was mixed with Arabic, and they also had a written Arabic script. And so Swahili culture is going to become more Islamic, but it's also going to help them uh, develop small chiefdoms, small kingdoms that are absolutely essential. So that'll wrap up this first part of the video. The second part of the video will be uh, just a couple of minutes much shorter than this one.